Hello, this is Don Austin, Superintendent of Palo Alto Unified School District, uh, coming to you at 5.30 on a Monday. Uh, this will always be rebroadcast as well. And tonight we've got uh, a few things to look at. We're gonna look at some survey results uh, coming back from, from our families. I'm gonna walk you through some of that. Then we're gonna spend some time with uh, some graduating seniors from both of our high schools. I'm looking forward to it. Just spent a little time with, with each of them uh, be, be, before we started broadcasting. And uh, I can tell you, wow. We, we have some exceptional students here, and it's going to be fun to, to meet them and, and to spend a little time with them uh, today. So we'll also talk about graduation plans for Wednesday, what that's going to look like, and how our community might, uh, might be able to join in on that and, and have some fun as well. So heading into next year, it's, it's full of uncertainty. And as, as much as we'd like to have all the answers, we just, we just don't right now. I was, uh, I was at Greer Park yesterday. I happened to live near the park and a uh, couple, couple things stuck out to me. Number one, uh, skate parks open and it was packed and there's people pretty much all over each other. Uh, some of those look like students, but hey, you know, it's up to you and your families. But the benches next to the skate park were not only closed, they're, they're caution taped off to make sure no one sits on the bench to watch the packed skate park. And then the trees and the flower beds were closed off also. But there were groups of cyclists who were certainly not all family members riding through together. These are the kinds of things that we're seeing all over the place, and it's, it's making it really hard to think about how we're going to open up a school. But I can tell you with certainty, one way or another, we're going to do it. And we're going to do it the best of our ability, and we're going to do it, uh, do it together. So one thing that we had done uh, just a week or so ago is to do a survey for all of our families. This is the mail home, mail home version. And I want to share some of those results with you right now. So I'm going to do a screen share. There we go. And here's the beauty of, of um, the new format that you're all going to get sent home tomorrow. We're going to send it home tomorrow, but I wanted to walk you through it today. You're going to be able to look at each of the results and then play around with it a little bit. So for example, you'll see the tabs up here on the top. I'm in the one that says Spring Reflections. And for Spring Reflections, we asked a question. The amount of schoolwork your child has received is, and then you can see anywhere from too little to too much. And you can look down here on the bottom and use the legend over here on the side to see that, well, okay, two to three hours is this big green band in the middle, okay? But here's where this tool gets pretty awesome. I can click over here and just click right on the just about right. And what I want you to do is watch the bottom change. When I click here, it recalibrates and now shows me that 1800 people said that the amount is just about right. Huh, so let's see what just about right means. Well, in this case, less than two hours for 300 people was just about right per day. And then two to three hours looks just about right for about 573. And then just about right means three to four hours for 500 more. I'm hoping you're seeing now that this is making our job not easier, but harder because if the goal is to get us all into just about right, that's not possible if people have such very different ideas of what's just about right. So you could say, well, that's because some of these respondents were for elementary and some for middle and some high school. True enough. So let's give that a look. Kind of keep this in your mind. And I'm gonna get rid of this part. I'm gonna say, well, what is just about right? look like for just our elementary school respondents. When we do that, it does start to break out a little bit that about two to three hours 
seems just about right. But that the number of three to four in less than two is almost evenly split. Okay, fine. So let's come back here and say, well, what about high school? Well, just about right for high school is almost exactly divided between three to four and two to three. So if we combine those two, I could say that somewhere between two to four hours a day seems just about right. Okay, well, let's use middle school. See how they fared on this one. Let me get rid of high school. And you can see a little bit of a shift. And actually, they want a little bit more than our high schools. Interesting. So let's go on to another tab and just give a couple other things a look. So I'm going to send this home. You'll all have it. You'll all be able to do exactly what I'm doing. Learning environment. So apparently for us, devices are not a problem. We looks like we pretty much got that taken care of. And the re reliable part of it looks pretty good too. So later at home, you can play around with all that. Now this one was of high interest to us because we asked the question, if you're given the choice of online or being in person, socially distanced, whatever that means by the time we get there, what are you thinking? And 25% of our families said, uh, yeah, we would choose the online. Well, let's come over here again say, what does that look like for just elementary? See, I selected elementary over here. Well, that number grows to 28%. And you can see down here, there's also a shift asking the elementary people, well, how much uh, live daily instruction, a place where we've got a lot of comments from, uh, would you expect? And it looks overwhelmingly one to two to maybe one to three hours. If we combine those two, that's about where that falls. But if we come over here and say, okay, fine, let's look at high school. Now the online version, people wanting online only, drops to 22%. And of those, even a bigger majority is looking at uh, somewhere between one to three hours a day. Choices to return to school, we broke it out by school level. And again, you'll be able to look at this and play around with it a little bit. Don't know what's going on. Barron Park clearly loves their school and wants to be there face to face. Everyone else kind of in a, in a range that looks uh, pretty consistent about the percentage of folks uh, saying that they want to come back. And at the end, we've got a giant response piece here that can give you some of the data about how many responses we had from each site, including special education. We're not going to break them out by, by person, uh, but it gives you an idea of our participation. So looking forward to getting this out to everybody tomorrow. Um, that's going to come out and it should be, uh, should be something worth giving a look. Now we're going to do two things quickly, and this is part of the beauty of a Zoom meeting for everyone who thought how easy it was gonna be. I can tell you right now, I've got my air conditioner going in this room and it's driving me crazy. So give me just a second while I turn that off. How's that for live? Okay. So now we're going to shift over into the, the more fun part of tonight and talk to some of our students. We have students here from both uh, Pally and Gunn. And again, I had a little opportunity to meet with some of the students earlier. And we're just going to go through and do some quick introductions of each. I'm only going to use first names and uh, hear just a little bit about them. And then we're going to ask them a few questions. They're not all going to get the same questions. We're going to bounce around here for a while. Again, these are seniors that are all just awesome students, good citizens, and uh, 
had a had a big chunk of their year uh, taken away from them with the closures with no advance notice. Uh, they're at school one day. Uh, even the ones that got the news about closing probably thought, okay, this is cool. I get three weeks and then we've got spring break and then we'll come back and we get a little extended break. Well, that wasn't the case. That's, that's, that was uh, where all of our heads were at the time. That just wasn't the reality of where we landed with these guys. And yeah, we all, we all feel terrible about it and, and for them. Uh, but uh, tonight we just want to to celebrate them a little bit. So, so for our students and you're all panelists, so you can all uh, unmute yourself uh, when you're called on, and and we'll do that and make sure that your video goes back on because we want to see you when it's uh, when it's your time to talk. But let's start with Allie. As soon as Allie pops, there's Allie. Hi, Allie. Let's get you unmuted. Allie uh, was a senior at Pally. She's an editor of the Pally Voice. And if anyone knows anything about our publications, my goodness, between our two high schools, we do some pretty amazing work uh, when it comes to the, the news publications. So Allie is the editor of the Pally Voice. She's heading to a school I've heard of. It's, it's called Stanford University. I believe it's located uh, directly across the street from my office. Uh, and has a sister who's graduating from Stanford there as well. But Allie, why don't you just say a, a hello and just a, a quick anything that you'd like to throw out, just a, a, a little warm up here. You're going to get some questions in a little bit. Uh, well, hello. It's real nice to be able to be here. I'm not sure. I feel like I'm spontaneous. What should I throw out? Um, I don't know. I'm excited to be here with everyone. Allie, we're going to come back to everybody. Thank you for being here. You're going to get a question here in just a minute. Awesome. All right, Neil. Let's get Neil up for us. There's Neil. Neil also at Pally uh, worked on the Campanile and the debate team, which means Neil with that combination. I'm terrified with you right now. You, you, I have sweat dripping down right now. A, a debate debate guy and Campanile. He's heading to the uh, UPenn in the fall uh, for engineering. So Neil, why don't you give everybody a quick hello. Hey everyone, uh, I'm really excited to be on this call. It's my first time I've, I've been on one of these things. And uh, I'm just looking forward to talking about my senior year and my experience at Pally, I guess. Great, we'll be right back with you in just a minute, Neil. All right, Pooja. There she is. Hi Pooja, Pooja is going. She's going to Amherst College, and she's just going to study neuroscience because, you know, why not? <laughs> so, Pooja, why don't, you, why don't you say hi to everybody? And have you had a chance to go back to Amherst and visit before the closures? Yeah, so I have never visited. Um, I have no clue what the school looks like beyond pictures and uh, videos I've seen. The, the school did a really good job, though, of um, having... I guess, virtual campus tours for um, admitted students to get a sense of what campus is like. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm really excited to experience the seasons. I keep telling my parents I can't wait for snow. I don't know what that means, obviously, but I'm still very excited by it. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to set foot on campus whenever that may be. Snow is awesome for the first 25 <laughs> minutes you're out in it. Then you're going to Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right on. All right, Pooja, we'll, we'll come back to you in just a minute. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, Lisa. There she is. Lisa's the uh, editor in chief of the Oracle at Gunn High School. She's heading off to Brown University to study psychology and English. You know, Lisa, I, I was an English teacher, and lots of people have said I could have used a psychologist along the way too. So this might be a perfect combo. This is great. Are you excited about going off to Brown? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm excited to try something different. Also excited to um, be somewhere with seasons. Um, yeah. Are, are you prepared? Do you feel good about it? I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. All right, we're going to bring you back in just a minute. And I've got a couple harder questions for you. All right, Josh, where's Josh? 
Josh is the SEC, which is the same as ASB uh, president for uh, Gun High School, and Josh is heading off to Columbia. So, Josh, thanks for being with us tonight. Yeah, thanks for having me. Josh, how do you like those headphones? Is that uh, do you use those in your Zoom <laughs> classes? I I do when when need to. Um, they're pretty nice. They're comfortable. Sounds All right, nice. what's on the shelf behind you? Um, a lot of books. Some great yearbooks, courtesy of um, the Gun Olympian, and uh, various sort of other things I have I found lying around. Okay, we may come back and explore that in a minute. Please, the do. best part of a Zoom meeting. Okay, and finally, Jonathan. Hello, hey, Jonathan. You're one of the founders of Maker X. That is actually incorrect. I'm a mentor at Make X. I'm one of the founders of the Village Studio, which is like Make X but at Gun. Oh, got it. Okay. Well, I want to want to know more about that in a minute. And you're going to Carnegie Mellon and just have a double major of robotics and physics. That is correct. There's not a third thing you want to throw in there? Might add a minor or uh, something else. We'll see. I, I think you should because this looks pretty <laughs> light right now. Yeah. <laughs> totally joking, Jonathan. This is pretty amazing. How did you pick these majors? Like, how did you get into physics and robotics? Well, Carnegie Mellon is, um, they're ranked very, very highly for robotics. And I kind of through my senior year, I always thought I wanted to be a mechanical engineer or an aerospace engineer. And then um, kind of realized through MakeX on the Village Studio, how much I love physically making things and not just studying things out of a textbook and, and a robotics program is going to let me do that. So... Yantin, you're going to be the first one to start getting the next level of questions, and then we're going to bounce around a little bit, okay? Awesome. What is something that you made or participated in making that you'd want to share with people um, during your time at GUN? Um, I think uh, that can kind of fall into two categories for me. Physical things, obviously. I've been on the robotics team. I've been on the rocketry team. I've worked on tons of my own stupid little projects um, that... <laughs> you know i have a physical thing that i ended up taking home or taking to a competition that that was really really cool the other thing is more conceptual i've built up a lot of what we do at makex i've run ran a lot of programs through makex i started the village studio over at gun which all of these are programs that you know they're not a physical thing it's an entity but it's something that's gonna outlive me it's something that's gonna continue being around after i leave gun and it's something that's been really meaningful to myself but also to an entire community of other people over at Gun and around Palo Alto. Jonathan, it's taken about 25 seconds for me to come to the conclusion you're gonna do some amazing stuff in the world. I'll, I'll try. Yeah, I'm sure you are. Who's your hero? Who do you look up to? Who's my hero? It's a hard one. Um, I really like Marie Curie. I really like AOC. I really like Albert Einstein is probably the cliche answer I have to give. That's a, that's a pretty eclectic group. Yeah. All right. Any thoughts about Elon Musk? Um, he's a little too eclectic, but definitely very smart. Okay. All right. Yeah. Within reason, you guys have two days left to your driving in a circle graduating. You can say, share any opinion you want tonight. So it's going to be fun. It's hopefully what I'm going to be end up end up doing. Okay. All right. Great. We're gonna we're gonna go back to Allie real quick. So Allie, let's get you on. There you are, Allie. We talked about the short nature in which you were all students were told, yeah, we're gonna be closed for a little bit, and then at some point it becomes a not a little bit. It becomes the, the rest of the year. What's something that you wish you could have said to one of your teachers face-to-face -face before you left, if you would have known? That is a great question. First of all, to all of my teachers, I would have said thank you, because I know there's so much work that goes into what they have they did before the closure and especially after the closure. Um, I think that I would probably tell, maybe I would tell my psych teacher, um, that what he has taught me in this past year has really impacted what I think I want to study. Um, all the teachers that have taught the social sciences, which you get a little bit more of an opportunity to study senior year at Pali, have really just 
um, they've done a really good job of teaching the topics that they do um, in a way that has really inspired me to pursue that beyond in college and explore um, other courses, which I may not have anticipated previously. How, is, how have you interacted with your teachers during the closure? I mean, I've heard a lot of, uh, I've, honestly, I've heard probably more from parents than I have from students about what that's looked like during the closure. So, um, you know, you, you don't have to use names unless it's positive, but uh, uh, what, what's it been like for you? I mean, you have high-end classes. So how, how have you got through them? Um, well, I think fortunately for a lot of the classes, we had actually wrapped up a lot of the um, instruction, like the new instruction, um, and we were towards the review period before APs. So I think that was really helpful because um, I feel like I didn't lose out on as much face-to-face -face learning. Um, but I had teachers, um, like our econ teachers would do, they all kind of joined together and they would do Zoom twice a week. Um, and that was super helpful. Um, and then my teachers would give us reviews and things so we could be ready for the exams. And that was um, just really a good help. And it was nice that we were at that point in the year that we were able to do that. So that was very serendipitous. Okay, good. All right, we're gonna come back to you. Let's go to Pooja. Pooja, I wanna, I wanna ask you the same question. What, uh, is there a teacher, a couple teachers that you wish you would have had a chance to see face to face and what would you have said to them? Yeah, um, it's funny, as you, was, as you were asking Ali that question, I was thinking in my head, oh, you know, what would I say? Who would I wanna thank? Um, I think, uh, I would say more than just one, but it, all the teachers who kind of did uh, small little things um, every day that to me seemed that, like they were a little bit silly or they're like, ah, oh, it's just a teacher being a teacher. For example, you know, our econ teacher um, would give us high fives on the way into class or um, we had my, my calc class, one of the most fun classes I've ever been in, not necessarily because of the material. I mean, math is fun, yes, but um, our teacher and our um, the sort of student community um, made it such that we were able to joke around and, and make it a much easier topic to digest just on an entire scale. So I feel like um, all the teachers who really taught the material well, but were able to add their own personal touches and were able to make it not school, but a fun place that I really wanted to go to and a place I wanted to be every day and a place I looked forward to going to, um, I think I would appreciate and I would want to thank them for, for taking the time to do those extra things for us. That's great. We're, we're going to come back to you in just a minute. Okay. All right, Josh, let's get Josh back in here. Josh, I've heard a couple things already about kind of the interaction piece do you have any thoughts for us going into next year? Let, let's say we have to open the school year and it's distance learning only, because it's possible, right? We don't know yet. There, there aren't any high fives virtually and jokes kind of translate and kind of don't when you're in a Zoom meeting. Do you have any suggestions for how we might keep that personal touch if we have to open from a distance? Yeah, wow, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think, that, I think that is one of the, the first things that you miss out on or the most important things you miss out on um, with distance learning is like this time like after the class or during brunch, you know, or like passing period when you're just like chatting with the teacher and like building that, that, that more personal connection um, outside of class. And I don't really know if there's one right answer with how you can um, replace all of that. I think a good start would be to have like um, more Zooms between teachers and, and students, mm -hmm. um, whether that's mandatory or opt-in policy or however you do it, um, but just being able to see your teacher and, and interact that way, um, I think can replace like maybe 65 to 70% of what you get with, with normal school. Um, and that's kind of the best we can do. Mm -hmm. What What's the plan at Columbia right now? Have they announced yet? Um, as far as what we've heard via like the Columbia Reddits and stuff, um, I think Columbia is going to open the next three semesters. So fall, spring and next summer and then split students among those. So at every point in time, there's less students on campus um, and then just working from there. Okay. Yeah. How has how this changed your 
excitement, enthusiasm about going away to college? Um, yeah, it's just a lot of uh, uncertainty, I guess, a lot of um, confusion in the air. Um, I think with any transition from high school to college, there's this period of like, I don't know how I'll, how I'll thrive, how I'll like survive without my parents telling me to do my work and stuff. Um, and I think that's even more so now when, um, you know, like half the country doesn't know what they're doing um, just because of the time we're in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll come back to you in just a minute. Lisa. There you are. So, uh, you are you're also traveling across the country for college. Are, are you or your parents nervous about you being so far away during this time when there's a lot of stuff going on right now? So we can start with the closures. Let's start there. Are they nervous about that? Are you nervous about it? I mean, I definitely am. Yeah, I think um, the uncertainty of like not knowing if I'm going to get to actually be physically in college in the fall and not knowing um, what anything is going to look like um, is definitely stressful and it's stressful to think about because it's hard to you know make plans or look forward to something when you don't really know what form that's going to take mm -hmm. um, so yeah for sure I think it's something that pretty much everybody is nervous about in one sh <laughs> some shape or form whether they're college students or anybody else sure sure now as the editor-in-chief of the Oracle, there are a lot of things going on in the country today, in the last few days especially, that you'd probably be writing about. How are you processing through that? Are you having conversations with your friends, your teachers, uh, anybody about some of the, the unrest in the country right now, or, or do you not have that outlet? Um, I think to some extent, yes. Um maybe less so than I would have been had I been in person with people because I think um, that is something that people would bring up more when it was a conversation that I was having rather than over text. Um, and I honestly think that it should be a conversation I'm having more than I am. Um, I will readily admit that. Um, I think that it's definitely, especially on social media, something that people are talking about right now. And that's very important to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. Well, I've read enough of your work to say we need people like you writing. Thank you. So, so stay, stay in there. Keep your, keep your head in the game for the stuff that matters, the stuff people should be writing about, talking about. Don't stop. That would, that would be, that would be a, a mistake for everybody if, if, <laughs> if you didn't keep that voice in some way. Okay. I said, when are you leaving for school or do you know yet? Um, supposing that we are in person, that should be in September. Okay. So a little later start. That's good for some of these schools. Okay. Yeah. All right, good. We're going to come back to you in just a minute. Let's, let's get Neil in here. Yeah. Neil, as a debate team guy, what was your favorite debate? What was the one that you got into with somebody or your team and, and you thought, Killed it. Yeah, I would say so. Um, I was on the debate team all uh, four years in high school. Um, and I did Lincoln Douglas debate, which is uh, one on one. So you may have heard of uh, 2v2 forms, but this is one on one. And we explore all kinds of debate topics. Um, and we also do it within a philosophical framework. So it's kind of a mix of policy and also like a, a sort of the moral side of, of what things ought to be in society. So with that in mind, I would say my favorite topic was my sophomore year. Um, it was about the criminal justice system and whether the United States should abolish plea bargaining. And I think ordinarily we might not really think about this, uh, but I think after we're seeing all the unrest and the protests, people are starting to think about what what is our justice system, how, how should it operate, uh, and what makes sense and what doesn't. And so um, I think, obviously, I, I support debate programs. Uh, I think everybody should give it a shot. But I think some uh, sometimes through exploring some of these really difficult topics, whether it's in a, a debate context or some other context, you can kind of 
learn a lot about how the country works and just things that you would not really explore in school. So uh, I would say that learning about plea bargaining was probably my favorite debate topic. Neil, so for an example, let, let's use that topic. Did mm -hmm. you choose your side or was it assigned? So the way debate works is the National Speech and Debate Association, they put out the topics uh, every few months and then the whole country debates that one topic for a given style of debate. So in my case, that was Lincoln Douglas. And then you have to prepare for both sides. Um, so you can uh, like, I think there's a saying that if you're a lawyer, you have to know both sides of the case really, really well if you want to be successful. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of the same idea where you really do have to prepare for both sides, the affirmative and the negative, because you will be debating both sides of the topic. So that's another way that you kind of learn and challenge some of your own opinions. Did you, during your time, debate any education topics? Um, I don't think, no, I don't think I debated any topics that were directly about education, but typically uh, it, it, might, it might come up in kind of like a, a side detail, but um, no, I, I did not debate any uh, topics that were primarily about education. Okay, last question. LeBron James, Michael Jordan. Yeah, I think I would have to go with Michael Jordan. Okay. Partly because LeBron isn't done yet. And I think Michael Jordan kind of elevated the sport of basketball in a way that was not seen for some time. And also, I think it's hard to compare because the game has changed a lot mm. since like the 95 Bulls. And I don't know. I, I think it's still a, un, a unsolved question. It, it's, not, it's not clear yet. <laughs> Okay, I think it was because in 1987, I had a sweet pair of Jordans that I played my high school season in. We'll come back. Good job. There might be more hard-hitting debate questions just like that. Sure. Let's, go to, let's go to Josh real quick. Yeah. Josh. Yes. We're going to do this uh, graduation car driving around town event. Are you going to participate? Yes, I plan to. I hope you do. Good. What is this something that helped a little bit, or is it just a thing? I mean, help me out with the the emotions of the final week of school, right? You, we know what a average final week looks like. How how is this comparing? How are you finding things to smile about? Yeah. Um... I don't know. Still, it still feels kind of weird. It doesn't feel super real. Um, my brain still kind of like treats it as like it's still like March 13th. I'm just waiting to resume school. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't think it's really hit me yet that I graduated. Um, but I guess it's also good. We saved the last like month or so of just like nostalgic crying. Um, yeah, I mean, still have to work out some emotions on my own. But um I'm doing fine so far. I get it. It if we uh, if we end up doing an actual ceremony in December, would you? Uh, are you thinking now that you would participate? What do you think about that? If we have a ceremony in December, um, I would for sure participate. Okay. Just because I'm going to be missing all my friends, um, and I I can't pass up on an opportunity to see them. Um, I don't know if it'll have the same effect or the same closure as one would um, like a normal graduation, but uh, given current situation circumstances, I would appreciate anything I can get. And uh, if that's a ceremony in December, I'd be happy to get it. Well, and let's do this. If, if the restrictions are lifted to the point to where we can have gatherings, it's just a promise, okay? So if, if, if the restrictions are lifted, we will do it. And uh, hope hope to see you there. And um, I think the only thing I would ask for is that we stagger the times because I'd sure like to shake the hands of every graduate from both of our high schools. So let's let's put that on the calendar at some point here soon. Yeah, we trust you to make the right decision. I think regarding. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, not everyone does, so I appreciate that. <laughs> it's all right. Let's go back to Pooja for a minute. 
There you are. Bridget, I was surprised that overwhelmingly the results of the student survey said that they did not want a virtual graduation. That, that just surprised me because I think people went so quickly into that planning in other places. Why do you think that was? Yeah, um, so I think Josh kind of touched on it a little bit. Um, but the biggest thing is it really doesn't feel real right now. And a lot of us haven't gotten the closure that we want, whether that be with um, staff members or with our you know, classmates who some of whom we probably won't necessarily see again or we won't see again for a very long time. Um, and so I think for a lot of students um, like myself who have been in the district for 13 years or even those who just joined this year, um, I think ending it all with a virtual Zoom, you know, hi, congrats, goodbye sort of thing is, was not ideal. And it was definitely not something that we wanted as our final moments as, you know, Pali students or gun students. Um, and so I think that was the biggest thing. I remember a lot of, um, of classmates texting me um, saying, no, like, please don't let it be a virtual graduation. Like, I, I can't do it. I won't attend. Like, it's just, it's not fair. You know, I, there's so much more that I've been looking forward to. I've, I've planned this entire thing, and this is definitely not what I wanted. Um, and I think given that we're, you know, a high school that's smaller than the colleges, say, who had to go immediately to planning for virtual graduation, I think it made it seem that it was a little bit more manageable or reasonable for us to be able to, you know, postpone or, or come up with some other plans that could still give us the closure and the in-person sort of goodbyes that we all really, really want. Um, so I think that was kind of why everybody was just immediately very much against it and why so many students are, are a lot happier with the, the proposed option. Wow. Um, I've done a lot of interviews uh, through my career, and I think I'd want to just hire you right now to come do them for me. <laughs> That's a fantastic answer. <laughs> so good, You're so articulate, so from the heart too. Uh, those are those are great qualities. What is there a topic that you wish the school district would have asked you about more coming up through the school system? Like this one, we asked, we got a surprise result we didn't guess, and it changed everything we did about it. So is there another topic out there? Um, I would say through ASB, actually, I've been fortunate in a lot of ways to have gotten the information pretty firsthand. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a lot of journalists in the group um, who would probably agree that, you know, they're able to, if whenever, you know, the, the people in charge are able to give them time for interviews, they're able to get information. Um, with, of course, pestering, but that's, you know, what comes with the, the role. Um, so I think we've been lucky to get that information pretty quickly. Um, I think the biggest topic that I hope students are continuing to be included on are, um, in a lot of sense, is just like hiring of personnel and uh, big, like large scale issues that directly affect us, whether that be um, this is a topic from the past, but, you know, weighted GPA, things like that. That was a huge discussion that a lot of students wanted to weigh in on because ultimately it's not affecting parents. It's not really affecting staff members in the same way that it's going to affect the students. Um, so I think the, the biggest thing is that the whatever the topic may be, I, there's not one particular. I think it's just the idea and the mindset that we should be including students on all of these uh, big ticket issues um, because in the end, we're we're the ones who are dealing with it um, firsthand the most. And so we should have a say and we should have a valid say in, in how that plays out. That's excellent. Really appreciate that. Thank you. We're, we're gonna come back. Jonathan. Hello again. How are you doing? Great. Jonathan, so you had, had um, really hands-on classes at Gunn with the, the areas that you cared about how did that work out during the closure? So how did you how did you guys have to make that work? Yeah, um, really, really good question and a question that I was hoping you were going to ask because this is something that I've been working on for a lot of years now through high school advocating for there to be more project-based options, um, less tests, less grades, less numbers and more projects. Um, and, you know, there aren't very many of these classes you know, I'm on GRT and that's a class that is very project based. Um, but other than that, you know, the last time I've done a, a real hands on project was a long time ago. And, and so there aren't very many of these classes, but there are a lot of programs that are extracurricular that employ that kind of that idea of hands on learning. And the 
the ones that I've been involved in are things like theater, um, where we, we build sets, we put on productions, things like MakeX that's completely not tied to a school where we just are, it's an unstructured format where you come together and build things. Um, but also project-based learning can come in the form of student journalism with a lot of students here are part of, you know, there's no, there's not very many tests. It's mostly building, making projects and creating things. And what we're seeing is that these programs are surviving much better right now than a lot of other programs. It, it's been really tough to learn math and science and history and English sitting at home, but the Oracle has been giving me a lot of my news about what's happening in PUSD. And me specifically with MakeX, we've been making um, face shields for hospitals and I've been interviewed by a lot of people in the Oracle. So you're seeing all these project-based programs that are actually working. So I think if that's any indication, we should be spending a lot of time figuring out what are other possibilities to create more of these project-based options because in the end of the day, we should be building a community of young people that are going to be able to take on these challenges and we have direct proof that project-based programs are letting us take on these challenges. So I think we should be adopting them. Yeah, I'm not even gonna joke around here. I'm like borderline emotional hearing this right now because the system is so entrenched and you have to do these things, earn this percentage, get this grade, take this test. And anytime we talk about deviating from that, we're accused of dumbing down a system. Absolutely. And you're one of the smartest kids, not a kid, you're one of the smartest young men I've ever been around. And you're saying exactly the opposite of that. You're saying, no, this is exactly what leads to creativity. Can, can you touch on that any more before we move on? Uh, yeah, 100%. I think, um, so MakeX is a really, really unique program. Just statistically speaking, we're the, the one and only completely student run, completely free makerspace in the country. There isn't another one like us. Um, and that's a problem. And the reason, the reason it's like that is because a lot of educators still believe in the system of grades and numbers. Um, and there's lots of justifications for that. I've been in meetings with people in all sorts of school districts. And, you know, we, we introduced this idea of a makerspace and there's tons of different responses to like things like it's going to create more inequality in higher and lower income schools. It's going to be expensive. It's not effective. There's less structure. Um, and, you know, some of these things are true. Some of these things aren't, but in the end of the day, you know, we can show that students can create meaningful work without having tests. And if you're looking at what's happening now, you know, this from many different standpoints, from an economic standpoint, from a social standpoint, the coronavirus really kind of exposes everything that's wrong with our society. Because everything that's failing now, it means that the system isn't robust. The reason the economic system is failing is because the economic system isn't built to be robust. It isn't built to work through a crisis. The reason a lot of the educational system is failing is because it isn't built to be robust. And yet I was on an hour long interview with an Oracle member talking about how I 3D printed 30,000 masks for hospitals through educational program. So if we can teach people to do that in schools, maybe we can create an educational system and a workforce system and an economical system or an economic system that is built to be robust and survive these crises and not just teach us to take tests. I want to stand up and do a cartwheel right now. It would be a really bad cartwheel, but that's how excited you just fired me up for education. I'm glad. I appreciate, appreciate it. In the job description. <laughs> yeah, that is good. That is good stuff. I'm going to go over to Allie here real quick. Let's get Allie back in. Hey, Allie. Hi. I want to have two questions for you. First of all, Allie, you've heard me ask other people a bunch of questions. Were there any of those that you wish I had asked you because you had a great answer? Oh my gosh, this, I, now I can't even remember the questions. This is in my mind. Um, I think, well, I think um, talking about just what Yalantin said, I mean, this is, I shouldn't even follow that up. I shouldn't even try it. But um, talking about project-based learning um, and specifically just these like hands-on collaborative things that we've been able to do just brought to mind for me um, student journalism and how important that has been in just my growth as a leader and my growth as a writer um, in a way that I think working with others in classes like that that are um, for the majority student-led 
um, those can be so impactful on, I think beyond somebody's growth as a student, I think that classes like that really help people grow as human beings. Um, and I think it's classes, classes like that, um, that help us learn to, um, learn to love to learn um, and do school, not because we're trying to get a 4.0 or all A's, or we're trying to get to a certain spot. Um, but I think that classes that teach subjects like that um, teach us to go to school because we really want to go to school, because we want to create something, because we want to learn something new. Um, and I think that another thing that we should encourage is classes that um, diverge a little bit from this classic path of math and English and science, which are all very important. We should definitely be studying all of those, but I think offering um, students more opportunities to explore other career paths. Um, for example, like Jonathan's um, is doing robotics, his um, village house um, and student journalism for some people and ASB and offering more opportunities like that where students can really kind of flourish and grow into um, just something better and learn to love what they're doing. Now, all, of, all of you guys, and it just worked out this way, I just asked both principals to get me some students. So I didn't ask for a profile of students and did not ask to be wowed by everyone's college destinations. It just worked out that way. But you guys are all top students. And, and a lot of the schools are now saying, you know, they may not even look at SAT, ACTs in the future. And uh, the credit, no credit became a, a moot point. And they all said, we'll take whatever. In fact, a lot of them went to the same system. Is that a good or bad thing in your mind? I think, I think that it is a good thing. I think it's a hard thing, but I think it's a good thing. Um, I think we see so many problems with the standardized systems, um, just so much inequality and lack of equity there, um, which is really challenging. And we're in a really fortunate affluent area. Um, and I've been really blessed with the opportunities that I have had and I recognize that. Um, but I also see that the system benefits people like me sometimes and it doesn't benefit other people in a way that's really unfair. Um, and so I think we should be moving away from systems that favor one group of people or favor one socioeconomic status. Um, because again, you are learning to test. Um, we take these SAT, you take SAT prep classes and you learn how to game the system. And it, that's what it feels like. It feels like a game sometimes. Um, but I also think that the SAT has been found to be a relatively good indicator of uh, collegiate success. So, and there are challenges with that. And I think that just shows the pervasiveness of the problems and how they continue throughout the rest of the educational system. Yeah. Um, and so I don't think there's really a good solution to move away from standardization because high schools aren't standardized. Um, so how do you, how is somebody's, how do you predict success when all the high schools look different? All the courses are different. GPAs aren't really standardized either because classes look different. So I don't have a solution for that, but I do think the fact that they're moving towards other options and moving away from um, these just unequal systems and that they're recognizing that, I think that's really powerful. Um, but I do think it's a challenge and I'm glad that I'm not the one who is faced with solving it. It is a challenge. And you said something kind of profound, like how do we predict success? And, and, and maybe, maybe that's the wrong question. Right? Maybe time will tell us that you know, uh, predicting the success of a kid the first time they jump on a bicycle is they're not going to, they're going to fail. Maybe, maybe the question becomes, how do we support students? I don't know. It's a good one, though. I'm going to ask, I'm going to start uh, with Lisa right now, and you're all going to get the same question. So I, I want you all to think about this one. It's going to be harder because you have to do it face-to-face -face live, you guys were all successful here and you're going to the biggest names that there are out there as far as schools and you're all going to be successful. How are you going to make this place a better place though? In whatever your field is, how are you going to contribute to making the world a little bit better? So either socially or professionally, whatever it is, I don't care. This is your answer, but what's your thought? Let's get us started. Sure. Um, so I don't specifically know professionally 
what area I'm going to end up in and what I'm going to end up doing. And that's something that I'm going to have to figure out in the next four years, but something that I've been thinking a lot about and realizing um, over the past couple of months is that something that's really important to me is that no matter what field I end up in, I want to feel like I am helping somebody else. So I don't want to be working in a field that feels not to like blame certain fields over others, um, but in a career that I feel like I am helping somebody else succeed or do better. And um, both those are not descriptive words, but I think specifically with psychology, um, I think that um, mental health is something that is very important and that I've learned a lot about over the past couple of years and the importance of that. And um, that is a field that I would be very interested in going into and trying to make concrete change in because I think that there's so much growth that needs to be done everywhere in the US within that field. Um, and that especially I think right now after this pandemic, we're going to see so much um, necessary, like so much needed mental health support for people that's just not in place and not a priority in the US right now. Um, and I don't know exactly how I'm going to be a part of that, but I really do think that that's something that's very important to be in. And um, I think through doing journalism, I've seen how changes can be made um, by drawing attention to certain issues. And I don't know if that's a way in which I could approach this or if it's going to be by, you know, becoming a clinical psychologist or becoming a therapist or whatever. Um, but I do really hope that that is a field in which I can make a difference to some extent. I think you're going to help a lot of people. It is great spending some time with you tonight. So I want to go on and see what Josh has to say on his contribution to the world. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Um, I think I have enough self-understanding to know I'm not the smartest or the talented person or the most talented person, um, even at Gun or even you know, in our school district. But I think, I hope that if I can just like, I don't have to change the entire world. I just have to change someone's world, you know. Um, hopefully, I can be a good friend to the, my close friends, a good, a good um, person to the people around me, um, and really just work from there. Um, so I, I can't say anything either. I can't guarantee um, like solving the world's problems. But um, I hope that I can, like, you know, from these, like, small interactions, from these little relationships, um, the world right now is pretty divided, pretty, um, I don't know. Uh, I think it, it, like even just, even just like small things, like, like just, um, loving someone the right way, um, or being a good friend, um, is really all I can aspire to, to be at this point. Um, so just no guarantees. Do you have family members watching this tonight? Uh, I believe so. I believe so. Good. Well, not super sure, but. I'm going to tell anyone who had anything to do with raising Josh. Good job. Josh, you're a good guy, man. I, your, your answer is just pure and, and to the heart and making a difference for anybody. And that's, you can wake up every day with that mentality. You're, you're going to, you're probably going to impact people you don't even know. So thank you, thank, thank you for being you. And thanks, thanks for everyone who's invested in you. Jonathan, you're you're up. All right. Um, Tell me about your difference. So, I really don't know the answer to to the age old question of um, what do you want to be when you grow up. Yeah. Um, the reason I chose Carnegie Mellon, the reason I chose robotics, is because I like it, and so I don't know what profession I want to have in life. But I'm really glad that my experience with engineering didn't only lead me to an engineering experience; it led me to this really awesome multidisciplinary world of education, um, working at MakeX, starting makerspaces, helping out with other makerspaces has introduced me to, to education and not just building things and studying engineering. And there's a, there's a philosophy in education called critical pedagogy that's been studied for a long time now. And it revolves around the idea of teaching somebody how to learn without just giving them facts. and and, and there's a lot of Marxism behind it, but that's not the point. Um, <laughs> the, the idea of, of teaching somebody to learn, teaching somebody to absorb information without just spewing facts on them has been really widely studied in things like social studies and English. Um, 
But until very recently, it hasn't really been explored in technical education. Technical education for a long time has been really, really terribly exploited economically because it's, it's wealthy people teaching poorer people how to do physical things, how to do actions, how to perform things and behave like a machine. But unfortunately, we can make machines behave like a machine. And so I, I've worked with people at Stanford and with some people in the makerspace community on creating critical pedagogy programs for, for technical education, teaching people how to think in the technical field. Um, and it's so inspiring to see what people do with that information. It's really amazing to see how people's mindset changes about technology and about information when, when they're taught by a friend and not by a teacher and when they're taught to think and not just to act. Um, and, and so I want, I think I want to be an engineer. I like building things. I don't want to give that up, but through becoming hopefully a good engineer, I hope that I can also take that and, and reform the way we teach engineering and the way we teach technology and the way we create an equal opportunity educational system that gives everybody the ability to learn things like technology because it, it's an amazing field and there's so much creativity and amazing stuff coming out of it and everybody should be able to experience it. That's pretty awesome. Johnson, you're, you're doing amazing things. I, I am writing down your name and I'm gonna look for it because we're all gonna be able to to find it at some point. Thanks, thanks for being with us tonight. Let's uh, let's go over to Allie. Yeah, again, following up, <laughs> Jonathan. Um, I'm sorry. Think, um, no, I'm happy to do it. Um, I think that um, there's a lot of it. The future is very open. I think for all of us right now, um, and there's a lot of uncertainty, and that's actually pretty cool. Um, there's so many different paths that we get to take. And I don't think that I will cure cancer and I don't think that I will end world hunger, though I'm pretty convinced that someone on this call will. Um, but um, I think that just like Josh said, I think that it's the little things. Um, there have been so many very important people in my life who have helped me grow into the person that I am today. Um, and I think that if I could be that person in someone else's life, I think that would be absolutely amazing if I could use all of my experiences, um, any obstacle that I've overcome or any, anything that I've been blessed with in my life, um, if I could use that to help someone else, I think that would be amazing. I think fostering other people's growth is what a real leader does and what I think everyone should move towards. Um, and just, I hope that I'll be able to live an unselfish life and kind of live in terms of other people as opposed to living in terms of myself. You guys are ridiculous. I am just so happy to have anything at all to do with this group. Uh, Ali, you're another one and I hope you've got some family members watching tonight. Uh, I'm sure they're proud of you. And if they're not watching this, I'm pretty positive they're proud of the person you've become. So thank you. Thanks for being with us. For this this and I'll be looking for a car with you in it on uh, Wednesday. Thanks for having me. All right, I'm going to bounce over to Neil. Yeah. So um, on the big question, uh, I want to start by saying that I recently saw an article, and it said something like, "Historians have found that there's four major things that have led to." Uh, huge changes in society. And those things are war, uh, revolution, um, state collapse, and pandemics. Um, so right now we're in the, the fourth one, the pandemics. And it's unclear how exactly society will change. But I think from my perspective, uh, since I will be going to the technology field, I think a lot of people in technology kind of feel like we're at a crossroads where on the one hand you have companies like SpaceX that are sending people to the moon or uh, um, sorry, not the moon, um, the space station. Uh, and on the other hand, some tech platforms are being used to like, um, some people are promoting like hateful or divisive stuff on there. So it's kind of like, how can technology be so good and so bad at the same time? And I think 
I will be going, I want to do something that will have a social impact component to it. Um, I think one example is climate change and overall how we're going to deal with energy in the coming years because the world will require more energy. And at the same time, we can't keep relying on fossil fuels um, and other dirty sources. So I think we have ten, about 10 years to figure out that problem and technology is gonna be a big part of it. So uh, from my point of view, I would like to go into some kind of technology space where I can work on a big problem like that. Um, and that's what I look forward to because there's, there's a lot of uncertainty as to how we're gonna solve these problems. But I think if we can send people into space and endure a pandemic and have protests in the streets all at the same time, I, I, think, I think we can solve some of these other problems. Yeah, well, we have all been through a year that's gonna be in history books. So Neil, thank you. Thank you for your responses and, and thanks for your time tonight. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, no problem. We're gonna end up with Pooja. No, no, uh, no pressure here, Pooja. You're just batting cleanup for the entire graduating class of the entire school district. So uh, your answer will define the entire district. Thank you, Dr. Okay, not, not really, <laughs> it's just for you, so. <laughs> um, I would say, I think my answer to this kind of goes back to um, the, the very first question that you asked me about the teachers that I would, or you know, specific teachers I would wanna say thank you to. And I think um, like Josh and like Ali mentioned previously, um, it was the little things that they did that I, recognized and that I really appreciated that made my day a whole lot better. And so um, I think I remember watching this um, one of those old like YouTube videos um, back when we were I think in elementary school or something like that. And it was this idea of this like social experiment where um, people would go out, go out into the street and, and somebody would do a good thing for somebody else. And then they would follow that person and that person would sort of create this chain reaction where they would do a nice thing for someone else and someone else. And, and they weren't even like big things. It was literally just smiling at a person or, or helping someone, you know, carry their grocery bags, whatever it is. And I think to me, that's sort of the idea that it's not a lot, it's, it's very little. As long as you do something small, um, you, don't, you really don't know who that's gonna benefit and how much of a difference that's gonna make in somebody else's life. And I think that's the really, the really powerful thing of one small thing can, can make a huge difference and that's what we should all be striving for. Not giant you know, goals that are oftentimes not necessarily the most attainable, but these small things that are within reach, um, small things that we can do every single day um, and without much um, to ourselves, really, it's, it's very, very easy to do. I think that's what I would hope to continue to do. Um, I think with an, a platform like ASB, say, you know, we plan so many events for people um, and I really enjoy these events and I have a great time planning them. Um, but unfortunately, the only thing you really hear, if anything, it's going to be the negative comments, right? You only hear the bad things that people have to say. And that sucks because, you know, why would we, why would we spreading negativity when we could be appreciating positivity, right? And so I think it's um, realizing that that's not what the majority feels. It's, it's the fact that, you know, even with one event, if you're helping one person, you're making one person's day, like that's all you can ask for. And that's, that's, that's a win in my book. Um, and I think professionally or, or whatever down the road, I have no idea what that looks like for me, but I hope that I can take that idea of, of, um, of paying it forward, of, of appreciating something that somebody has done for me and being able to do the same for somebody else. And I think if everybody were to take, you know, five minutes out of their day to do that, that would be, that would make a world of a difference. And I think that's something that we could all very easily strive for. Well, I'm like speechless. <laughs> and that's rare, it's rare. <laughs> Pusha, thank, thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for who you are. And it's been fun getting to know you a little bit over the last couple of years. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> so in in closing tonight, um, you know, our, our district is uh, ranked the number one K-12 district in the state of California. And yet we get plenty of criticism. And while it's hard to take the credit for the students that we just met tonight, there's so many factors that go into creating what we just saw this is why this place is special. You, you just saw it. You just saw it. You, you just saw 
incredibly gifted students who also have a social conscious, they're articulate, they know where they're gonna go, they appreciate others, uh, something right is happening. And, and it's our job to, to build upon that, keep it rolling. Uh, last thing, invitation for the entire community, 545 on Wednesday, uh, parade route is posted. Email went out to every parent today. Uh, this is for the, the route, the parade piece is for seniors only and their families. But let's say if we can get out on the streets, line up, you can, look, if we can wait in line at a safe way and follow arrows and keep distancing, we should be able to stand on a sidewalk and salute our students. So let's do a good job. Uh, thanks, and that's uh, that's it for tonight.